Okay, let's get started. So thank you for joining us today for our webinar about defining success for yourself within the legal profession and beyond, as well as the myriad paths to achieve your success. Our esteemed panelists will share about evolving your career, family and community involvement, volunteerism, and offer concrete tips on gaining strength to forge your own path. This is the first installment in the Navigating Your Career series organized by the American Bar Association's Commission on Women in the Profession. My name is Jin Huang, and I'm honored to serve as a commissioner with the ABA's Commission on Women in the Profession. Most recently, I was Associate General Counsel with Verizon Communications and have been thoroughly enjoying a multi-year hiatus with a focus on travel, family, and friends. I'm a past National Asian Pacific American Bar Association president and currently serve on the boards of two different nonprofits, the Women's Excellence Network and the League of Women Voters of New Jersey. I also founded a consulting company, Jinvest in Consulting LLC, that offers financial education, Jedi consulting, and executive coaching services. I'm looking forward to discovering my next chapter of success and opportunities through this webinar. And I hope you are too. For those who are not yet familiar with the ABA's Commission on Women in the Profession, its mission is to secure full and equal participation of women in the ABA, the legal profession, and the justice system. The commission is part of the Diversity and Inclusion Center, an ABA Goal 3 entity. It provides guidance, spearheads numerous projects, and enhances collaborations to eliminate bias in the justice system. To learn more about all our projects and research, please go to ambar.org slash women and the various websites will be included in the chat for your reference. I'd like to share about some of our current projects, including the GRIT project, which started in 2013. And the GRIT project uses research and anecdotal stories of women lawyers of diverse backgrounds and fields to educate about the science of the GRIT and growth mindset two important traits of many successful women lawyers. The GRIT Project Program Toolkit, which is available to everyone, provides program agendas, discussion scenarios, PowerPoint presentations, handouts and suggestions for additional reading and learning opportunities. Lisa Dunner and I serve as the co-chairs of the GRIT Project. And what's very exciting is that the commission has completed a new phase of GRIT research with Dr. Milana Hogan, exploring the ways in which grit and growth mindset impacts team performance. This research will become a critical part of the GRIT project toolkit and will help women lawyers develop their leadership skills and become even better collaborators, team managers, and leaders in the profession. The report, Leveraging Grit and Growth Mindset to Drive Team Success will soon be issued. And we are planning a launch webinar with Dr. Hogan in the near future. So be on the lookout. Another project is the experiences of Native American women attorneys. We have been collaborating with the National Native American Bar Association on a study that explores the unique experiences of Native American women attorneys who navigate the intersection of tribal identity, race, and gender in the legal profession. Linda Benali, past National NABA president, and I are the research project co-chairs. This study will contrast the perspectives of junior attorneys one to five years out of law school with those of more experienced attorneys 16 to 20 years plus out of law school. A firekeeper circle was formed as an advisory council comprised of national NABA past presidents and current officers, as well as ABA designated representatives to provide guidance on the study. Our researcher NextGens will interview 50 registrants one-on-one -on -one and conduct two group sessions with the remaining 100 registrants. We plan on issuing a written report next spring. The last project I'd like to highlight is the Parenthood and Child Caregiver Study, which is designed by research professionals to gather and analyze current data about attorneys who are parents and caregivers of children. We are seeking participation by men and women lawyers with and without children including people who no longer practice law. 
And this is very timely because the survey will be open for responses until midnight tonight. And the report, along with actionable recommendations, will be released in the first quarter of 2023. Commission Chair Maureen Mulligan, Michelle Brown and Coughlin, and Juanita Harris are the co chairs of this important study. All of our panelists today are contributors to an anthology titled Women in Law, Discovering the True Meaning of Success. The book is the brainchild of Angela Hahn to celebrate women who have forged their own path and includes the stories of 23 amazing women total. This book is written for pre-law students, law students, and new attorneys, although I believe it will also inspire more experienced attorneys as well. I know I was. The book's stated purpose is to educate women in the legal field on how to define their own professional success. In addition, a portion of the net proceeds are generously being donated to Ms. JD. And this is what the book looks like. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and other fine retailers. Ms. JD is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the success of women in law school and the legal profession. In 2010, in partnership with the commission and in conjunction with the 20th anniversary of the Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Awards, Ms. JD awarded fellowships to 20 rising third year law students who are being mentored for one year by women cho chosen from among Brent honorees. And our partnership together has continued through the years. So I'd like to also invite everyone participating in this webinar to share in the chat if you are a law student junior attorney or an attorney with more than 10 years of experience. And please also use the Q&A function to ask questions about the panelists, to ask questions that the panelists can answer at the end, time permitting. So let me introduce you to our esteemed panelists. Bhavna Fatnani is a licensed lawyer and company secretary from India who currently lives in Canada. She is currently associated with Ernst & Young where her role encompasses aspects of contract management and compliance with anti-money laundering laws and policies. Bhavna is a passionate writer and mentor. Her articles have appeared in Report Her, India's first women's only newspaper since 2017. She's also been a guest speaker for podcasts such as A Shot of Life and Budding Lawyers. And you can find out more about her on her website, ibhavna.com and on social media using the hashtag, her stories with Bhavna. Next, I'd like to introduce Tasha. Tasha Gordon Troy is a Maryland attorney, an experienced journalist, an award-winning editor who's passionate about good writing and making people sound better than they thought they could, which we can all use. She is the CEO of Ramsey's House Publishing LLC, a publishing consultancy and author services company. It is her publishing company that published the inspiring Women in Law Anthology. Tasha regularly speaks on topics including content marketing, thought leadership, publishing, branding, and social media. Her articles have appeared on attorneyatwork.com and in Attorney in Law Magazine and the Maryland Bar Journal. You can learn more about Tasha at her website publishingforlawyers.com, and the hashtag behind the book. Next, we have Krista Lynn Russell. She currently serves as Deputy General Counsel of Airbus OneWeb Satellites on the Space Coast of Florida. Throughout her years of practice, Krista has counseled businesses ranging from startups to Fortune 50 companies. She is an entrepreneur, blogger, and founder of General Counsel U a membership community for law students, associates wanting to make the transition to in-house, and current in-house counsel looking to level up their careers. Krista is the founder of Recovering Superwoman, a blog and safe place to, created to encourage and normalize vulnerability among working professionals. Last and certainly not least is Jamie Zoll. She is a partner with Brand Law in Maine. She assists businesses in all aspects of state and local tax, from compliance to audits and administrative proceedings through litigation. Jamie is the president of the Trinity College Alumni Association, alumni liaison to the Board of Trustees, 
and a founding member of the Women's Leadership Council. She also serves on the board of Mothers Esquire and heads up the Pump Up the Bar campaign. If you'd like to read more of Jamie's writings, then also check out Amazon bestseller, hashtag networked, an anthology about the power of women supporting women in a digital community. Okay, let's get to the meat of this. So based on what I've read in the book and our prep sessions, I love how y'all have achieved success, but unique to you and how you defined it. So the next few questions are gonna be for Bhavna and for um, Christy, uh, Krista. So first, Bhavna, when you first graduated from law school, did you have a different, more traditional view of how success is defined? Bhavna? I think Bhavna may be frozen. Why don't we start with Krista first then? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I guess the answer like every lawyer is it depends, yes and no. Um, I went into law school with a very non-traditional path in mind, knowing that I was, um, I didn't wanna practice privately. I, I really wanted to just work in business as an in-house counsel. And so I knew that my path would not be the, the traditional path of um, going and, and clerking and being an associate and, and, and kind of following the, the, the path that they tell you that you're supposed to in law school and in the immediate years after. So in one way, um, what I defined as success was really being able to work in business um, in-house for a company. But I also had all of these other preconceived ideas about what success meant. And that largely for me involved doing as much as possible for as many people as possible for as long as possible, um, which uh, you can quickly learn is a, is a nice path to burnout. So in, in a lot of ways, um, some, some things remain the same in my mind and in many ways, my definition of what that was changed. Great, thank you so much, Krista. I think that's probably true for uh, many of us as we uh, continue longer careers and think beyond the legal field as well. Bhavna, are you back? Yes, I okay. am. I'm so sorry. I broke it at my end. No worries. No worries. This is what happens when we have famous international panelists. So, um, so for you, when you first graduated from law school, did you have a different, more traditional view of how success is defined? Well, when, when I graduated out of law school, I was already working in a compliance role and I didn't want to practice law. Like that's how, it, it was just an additional degree that I wanted because that was the most accepted combination uh, for a professional. But it so happened that uh, my mentor with whom I was working back then, Oh no, Bhavna. Give me. Okay, we can hear you again now. A better idea of what the legal practice could be like, and completely practicing law to ending up becoming an adult. Is is it better or? It is better now. It's funny because it was perfect in our prep sessions. <laughs> But uh, I think you're coming in better now and also your face is more focused. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. So um, Bhavna, why don't we stick with you and you can uh, share with us how you determined what true success looks like to you and uh, whether your definition of success evolved or changed as you continue to progress in your career. Yeah, yeah.
Are others able to hear Bhavna? Is it just me or? Okay. Oh, I'm, I know Esther, we can't hear either. <laughs> And Bhavna has such good things to check back uh, to to share. So, um, oh wait, Bhavna's so the, back. The idea of success for me was very simple: making money and uh, you know becoming a professional in the industry. That's that, uh, so Bhavna, we're still having trouble hearing you. So I wonder, maybe you could dial in and then that way we'll be able to hear you even if we're not able to see you. Would that be all right, Bhavna? Or maybe you can try to um, uh, end and then come back on. So uh, in the meantime, uh, let me go to Krista and ask you the same question. Uh, I think you had sort of touched a little bit on this, how um, you determine what true success looks like to you and how has that changed over um, your decades of practice? Um, all right, I, I, you know, trial and error is really, <laughs> Um, a little bit of, of my answer and I, I'd be, I'd be anything, you know, I'd be dishonest if I said anything else. There was a, a large part of my career where I went in and I had, a, you know, a notion of what I thought success would look like in that role in that department and that company. And, you know, with, with trying things and seeing how they work and some evolution of myself and, and, you know, growth with various companies that I had some longevity with, and even in moving from position to position, as I did early in my career, um, I, I really found that, you know, it, it really evolved. I, I had a series of mentors, you know, throughout my career thus far that have, you know, shaped and influenced and challenged me as well as evolving goals for myself. And of course, like, you know, many people I'm sure can relate to, there's a point in my life where I was deciding about having children and I decided to proceed with that. And then that really causes you to question everything from a career standpoint. Um, I was always very internally motivated. And so I wanted to be able to continue to achieve. And then having kids, particularly for me, as I write in the book, like I, I feel like I had this achievement addiction where I had to really just continue to achieve to have any, you know, value or meaning in, in my life. And it really was through, you know, a, a major failure in my life unrelated to my professional, you know, occupation, where I, I found that like, actually, the very arbitrary, North star like goals that I had for myself really had very little to do with what I thought success meant success that I, I thought meant, you know, surviving difficult things and having, you know, adversity quotient and resilience and it really meant learning to be authentic and vulnerable, which allowed me to move to practicing at the top of my license versus having things that um, held me back because I wasn't able to, you know, fully um, dive into any particular role, I, I started to embrace the various pieces of my life that, that were part of me. Instead of apologizing for being a mom or apologizing for having to start later in the day, I said, you know, I, I took the perspective and I expected those that I worked with to be grateful that I made it to that meeting <laughs> on a given day, you know, um, and I, I, I really like leaned into the idea of I didn't have to do it all. I didn't have to be it all. And I certainly didn't have to apologize because I was delivering, you know, the same level that many of my, you know, male colleagues were, um, or non-parents, you know, we ask questions of moms, I think, you know, as in our profession that like, we would never ask men, you know, <laughs> like we, we have conversations and we have expectations that just aren't shared by, by everyone. Um, Kim, hey, I wanted to say to you, you pop, I saw you in the chat that you're from Orlando too. Hey, um, I'm here also and I'll <laughs> dealing with the hurricane. I thought I was going to be the one with a bad connection today, but so far so good. Um, thank you for being here um, along with everybody else today. But you know, when you asked how it changed, it's really for me about um, embracing what I wanted. It was realizing that I didn't have to let an external societal, cultural, professional, you know, view of success, be success for me. I went into law school with a very different definition of what I would success would look like. 
And there was no reason I couldn't come out and continue in my profession with my own definition. And it was really just embracing that that was all the difference for me. Yeah, I love that. I also loved um, how you went in depth in your chapter in the book about the recovering superwoman, because I think so many of us feel that and uh, we put these expectations on ourselves, but we also feel it externally. And like you said, um, a lot of other people don't get the same type of expectations yeah. or questions put on them. And so um, I, I love how you think everyone should be lucky and glad and grateful that you showed up for the meeting because <laughs> you're achieving, right? You're excelling. So um, of course, so I love that. And then, um, okay, we're gonna try one more time. I think Bhavna said she's on a different network. And so um, Bhavna, um, what were your thoughts on how your success has evolved? I hope I'm audible now. Okay, and then, you know, I think we're all gonna have to send some sort of complaint to your telecom provider, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, can you share with us how your definition of success has evolved over your career? And were there any people or experiences that helped or drastically changed your definition of success? Oh no. <laughs> you know, um, Jen, I wonder, I, I suggested her maybe turning her video off. Maybe that video feed is taking a, a large part of her, her service. So I wonder if even disabling our videos from her side uh, might, might help with her connection. Yeah, or um, even just dialing in so we could just hear her voice um, so that there isn't a lag. Yes. Um, so I, I'll quickly, um, I can't say, so no, it's not working. Okay, no, we could hear you better now. Is, is it better now? I switched off my it is. Screen. There's not yeah. as much of a lag. Awesome. Okay. So um, going back to the question, um, the idea of success um, definitely evolved for me because when I entered the law practice, it was um, mainly working hard, making more money, becoming the famous professional. But then I realized like it's going to lead to a burnout. I'm not going to enjoy what I'm doing. So I went on to focusing on maintaining a work-life balance than just working hard. And uh, fast forward seven years today, uh, I am at a much better place. I am equally successful and I have a good personal life. So it's all going well for me now. And um, this, this mainly came from noticing how my family played a very important role. They, they really backed the idea of success that has changed for me. And yeah, that's, that's how I'm progressing each day. Excellent, thank you so much, Bhavna. And it is much easier to hear you. So uh, thank you for that suggestion, Krista, but uh, turning off the video, so um, awesome. Thank you both so much. Um, let's jump to the next question. And this is for Tasha and for Jamie. So once you figured out what you wanted your definition of success to be, how did you figure out your path to achieve that success? And why don't we start with Tasha? Oh, cool. All right then. Um, oh, uh, a lot like, uh, what Krista was saying too, in terms of um, how success, how the definition of success changes over time. So really when it came to how everything came together for me was, I guess when it came to law school, unlike a lot of the students with whom I attended law school, um, I had already been out in the workforce. Um, I had been a full-time employee. So I was already a few years older than everybody else. And they had all gone straight from undergrad to law school while I had been out working um, and I've been working in accounting for quite some time. So by definition of success sort of changed again um, when I decided to go to law school because it's like a totally different um, path that I was, that, that I was about to, to embark on. So graduating from undergrad, already working in accounting, I simply thought for the most part that the easy route would be, you know, I'll get my MBA, I'll get my CPA, and then I'll just keep plugging away in corporate accounting. 
And so again, that was the safe route. Um, that was the route that I had become accustomed to at that point. But then a family member who I, whom I really respected suggested law school to me. And I probably looked at him like he had more than one hit because I literally had never even considered law school. It never crossed my mind. And it was almost as if I didn't even know law school existed at the time. So when he drop that little little you know tidbit in my ear it got me thinking and it at least intrigued me enough to where I wanted to research it and figure out you know what is this law school thing what is this all about because you know I'm already on a trajectory you know I'm going to get my CPA I'll I'll sit behind a desk crunch some numbers you know be good with that and uh, you know needless to say there's no real challenge in that <laughs> <laughs> so after doing my research and figuring out, you know, I was still, I was still kind of young at the time, you know, why am I going in this direction? Why am I, it, why do I have this mindset where, you know, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'll be doing when I'm 50 and blah, blah, blah. And so I looked at this situation. And I thought, you know, I'm going to jump at this. I'm going to see where this goes. And by when I decided I was all in at this point. And no offense to accountants, of course, but accounting is boring and safe. <laughs> and I, I realized that, you know, I'm too young for this. I'm too young to be safe. I'm, I'm too young to be bored to death for the next 50 years. Um, so I tried something new. What's weird about it, though, is at my place of work at the time, I had already found myself taking up for people on staff. And I remember a couple of times where, you know, there are certain policies and procedures that didn't quite sit well with me or didn't, you know, didn't quite pass the smell test or something. And um, I found myself really advocating for people with HR. And I don't even know where that came from, but it was like, you know, what better way to really pursue that part of my personality, but, you know, you know, why not go to law school and figure out what, where, where that actually fits? So it's funny because after my first year of law school, I kind of redefined again what success was going to be for me. Um, I was so intrigued with the role of the legal analyst on cable TV at the time, and this dates me, but this was when OJ Simpson trial was being televised. And you got you've got all the legal analysts are sitting around a table and they're all discussing um, that whatever happens in court that day and they're breaking it down and making it um, making it more understandable for the people who are watching. And that really, really intrigued me. It sparked my interest in, in, in educating the public somehow. And it was funny because before I knew it, I was taking journalism classes at another university across town from the law school, flying it back and forth up and down the highway, still keeping my full-time law um, commitment. And it's it, and and all my other all my other friends were trying to land internships with, with law firms while I was out trying to get jobs at the local news station as a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> to try to learn, you know, journalism and, and, and that sort of thing. So nobody understood what I was doing. And looking back, I'm not even certain that I could explain it in the, in the way that I felt it. I felt it more than I could explain it. But I knew where I was going. I knew there was a path to be taken. Um, and it didn't matter whether they understood it or not, because I, I had some I had a deep feeling and knew where I was going with this. So I ended up being having a focus on media and communications and journalism, but how it related to law and, and educating the public on, on law. And I've been able to make a very long and successful career in legal education by way of publishing and creation and delivery of content in that way, so. Yeah, no, you're quite the Renaissance woman. I, I really enjoyed reading your chapter and then and that um, you find the law more exciting 
thing, accounting, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, the, the, the fact that you were interested in journalism and, you know, I mean, you really defined how you wanted your success to look like, um, but it takes those people to make those suggestions, right, to somehow, you know, know your personality, your character, because you said you never even thought of law school. It wasn't on you know, the list of like the five different kinds of degrees you were looking at. So um, it, it really helps to have those people and, and to listen to them, right? People could be sharing their thoughts, but if we don't listen to them because they know us, then we're missing out on opportunities. So right. thank you so much for sharing that, Tasha. Jamie, what about yourself? You know, I, I think like, like everyone on the call today, the, the biggest, um, epiphany moment for me was realizing that six the idea of what success is will change just that it will change um was um was profound for me coming to that realization and that i i wanted to embrace that idea that you know success is I don't want to say fluid, but it, it evolves, constantly evolves. Um, and that was a good thing. Um, and I, I think for me, once I really started leaning into this idea of what success meant um, as a career model, it became much more for me about um, uh, community and um, advocacy and the structures around me that um, helped me feel empowered and in which that I felt like I could empower others to reach their own ideas of success. So, you know, things that, um, that I leaned into that helped, um, I guess, let me like kind of start with an earlier story, kind of to Chris's point, like things that people say to women that they probably wouldn't say to men. Um, when I first graduated from law school, um it was in the middle of the last great recession um and it was the worst hiring market for lawyers in a very long time um and i remember going to this program for brand new graduates while we were all still waiting to get our bar exam results that my law school put on that and it was helmed by an alum an older white man um and I remember at one point in time in that saying, like, I really want to do state and local tax or financial compliance. I laugh particularly at com Tasha's comments about accounting because I drank the tax Kool-Aid and I absolutely love it. <laughs> and tax is cool, guys. It really is. Um, but um, I, but I remember making that comment that I wanted to pursue this practice area. Um, and it wasn't so much like... Um, I wanted a job for sake of getting a job. It was, I, I wanted to be really intentional about pursuing that practice area, even from an early end. And this older alum said to me, well, stop being a princess and just go get a job. You don't have the luxury of holding out um, for the, you know, the job for you. You need to just get employed. Um, and it has stuck with me ever since then that like, for one, who's going to go and call someone a princess out there? Like the the pejorative tone of that in and of itself, but also that you would not want to encourage someone to be intentional about their job future if they really did have a strong preference for a practice area. Maybe, you know, I didn't know that I wanted a particular you know, employment environment, but I wanted a particular practice area. Um, and SALT is niche, state and local tax is what I do. It's niche. And um, there's not a whole lot of, uh, you know, difference, if you will. You know, there's public sector, there's accounting firm, and then there's, you know, a law firm um, and or academia. And and I knew that I wanted that. Um, and I still do. Like I said, I drank the <laughs> I'm all in on salt and I, I absolutely love it. And for me, it was it, the, the pursuit of success, like I said, was not just um, career aspirations. Um, you know, I always wanted to work on a Supreme Court case. I have done that. And I, it, fingers crossed that, you know, the next um, test ones are in the works. Um, so, you know, case number two, 
you know, I'd say my ambition is I, now I'm going to be at council table next time as opposed to just on the team. And, and then I'll be the one arguing it because heaven knows we need more women arguing before the Supreme Court. Um, and, and for me, it was kind of identifying what are the parts of SALT that I really, really love and pursuing those opportunities as they came, being, like I said, involved in a community of other women that helped me learn how to advocate for things for myself um, in my career, advocate for the fact that I felt I needed a professional coach on the outside to learn skills, the day-to-day -day practice skills and business development skills that I was not getting in my firm. Um, and things like that, where, you know, it, it was the leaning into this idea that the context wasn't as much as important as it was doing the work, working with other women, being in a community um, was really, really, and has always been important to me. And that is where I really saw things um, flip. It is what led to me getting involved in this book, being part of that type of empowering community um, where, you know, we we recognize that what is success for me is, I mean, you've, you've heard it on the call already, is not the same as success for Tosh. I mean, we're like polar opposites on the accounting spectrum right now. It's not the same for Krista. It's not the same for Bobna. And that's beautiful that we all have something that is um, an idea of what our own success is, that it doesn't have to be go to law school, get in big law, become a partner. And that that is an excellent route for someone, but it doesn't have to be the route for everyone. Um, and, and that is something that um, uh, I wish I had that when I was in law school. I really did. I wish I had that perspective and appreciation. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jamie. And um, I think that also, like what you said, that you had reached out and gotten a coach, I think getting um, professional experts for the same reasons why people hire lawyers, right? To get our expertise, we should not be afraid to reach out to other experts. Um, some of the topics that we had discussed in the past uh, with all the panelists were um, mental health and seeking out experts to, to assist with that. Um, the community, right? Building of the community because there's so much that we didn't learn in law school, right? Especially about business development. We only learn about how to be good lawyers we don't learn actually how to run a business and uh, we don't learn how to network. We don't learn um, so many different skills that we realize that we now need um, other than just practicing the law. So thank you so much for sharing that, Jamie. And um, sort of tying into that theme, uh, what I found so heartening in reading your chapters in the book and in our discussions is that everyone decided that part of what defines success for each of you was focusing uh, on family and your communities or maybe reprioritization, right? After having so many uh, experiences where you weren't able to focus on family. So uh, this is for everyone. Did you all have an epiphany or a series of moments that made you decide to prioritize your family and community? I know, I know all of you have some really interesting stories to share. Who wants to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Tasha. It's you, Tasha. It's you. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, it was it was really a series of moments that that culminated um into something not necessarily a good thing, but it turned out to be a good thing. So um a series of moments that brought me to the realization that life needed to be more balanced. Um, and the funny thing is, I never expected life to really be balanced because that's just not possible when you talk about family and career. Um, if you shoot for balance, then you're, you're really shooting an, for an impossible test. So you're, you're looking to, to fail if that's what you're, you're going with. But for me, the realization that, that, that sort of hit me, the different moments were, at the time, my marriage was falling apart. Um, my mother was developing dementia and she was living with me at the time. And at the time too, I realized that my son had reached a certain age where he had been playing baseball and doing different things. 
And I had not witnessed any of his accomplishments during this period of time. So those things sort of came together. But at the same time, the weird thing about it is none of that actually pushed me to make a change, though. <laughs> it, was, it was like, even though all that stuff is coming together, it's in my head, but it's not really pushing me to make that change because, you know, the ambition still exists. You know, you're still pushing. You're still thinking that everything you do is for the benefit of your family. So you're actually making these excuses as you're going along. So it actually came down to a sudden decision that was outside of my control, as in the fact that I got laid off. And that helped wake me up to my own reality that I had devoted a lot of my adult life to someone else's cause um, while making concessions that placed my family on the back burner. And all the time, all, all this, during all this time, I'm, I'm convincing myself again that what I do is for the benefit of my family. So then the question became, did my family really benefit from my absence? And I had some decisions to make at that point. Do I jump back on the, the, the hamster wheel, get out there, you know, land another job, or do I do something that I'd always wanted to do, but never really made the move for? And by being laid off, it kind of cleared the path for me to do that. I wanted to start my own business. I'd always wanted to do that, but never took the time to do it. And that's what led me to, to, to doing what I do now. I started my own business. I was able to work from home so that I could be there for my son and for my mother in her last years. Um, my son was probably about 14 at the time and he was still playing baseball and he was running track and I was there for every baseball game and every track meet. And I think our, our relationship definitely grew during that period of time because he knew I was there for him at that point. There were times when he was young and I'm 60 miles away sitting in my office and he's, he has to go to bed. He's three, four, five, six years old and we're on the phone and I'm talking to him and putting him to bed by phone. And he's asking me questions like, mommy, why can't you be here to put me to bed? And that was, it was heart wrenching, but I always made that, that decision or that, that thought that, you know, well, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for us. And it got to the point where you can only do but so much. There are things, there are times when your family needs you to be there. And I knew that by starting my own business and making that decision, yes, it meant that I was going to have less money, but I also came to the realization that money isn't everything. And you get to a certain age and you look around and you, and you really do have to figure out what are your priorities? How can you be there for the people who love you and the people you love while also still bringing in the bread, but you, you do have to find a different way. And, and again, success defines itself all over again. It's like, I'm, I'm not that person anymore. I'm, I don't want to necessarily be locked inside of a, an office 60 miles away from home simply because I think, you know, it's, it's somehow going to get me to a higher plane or get me more money or whatever. I've been doing it long enough. People needed me. And I had to, I had to make that change um, in my head and being laid off actually pushed me in that direction a lot quicker than I thought that I probably would have pushed myself, but it came in a good time. It came in a good time. Great. Thank you so much, Tasha. I, I love how it was a, an external circumstance that pushed you to do something that you'd already been thinking about. But sometimes we just need that little impetus, whatever it might be. And, um, you know, as we were uh, discussing earlier, you know, sometimes the, the priorities change or the balance changes um, as we uh, progress with our families and with our careers and how we want to uh, shape that. Um, what about other panelists? Uh, could you share if whether you had an epiphany or a series of moments? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to jump in here because this is such a big part of, of my story, but I think relatable to, to others, regardless of personal experience. And 
First, Tasha, thank you for taking us to church there. That was, I, I loved everything that you just said. And I, I, <laughs> I just want to clap for you. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, you know, for me, part of my um, shift, I don't want to say shift towards family, but shift towards reprioritizing success and what that really looked like and implementing it, which is a whole nother step after awareness was part of that recovering superwoman kind of idea that you know touched on in my introduction and, and a little bit earlier which is um i i should add in my story i until recently was a full-time single mom of three kids um i moved across country uh, two weeks into the pandemic for a position um after extracting myself from a very um, abusive marriage and so I had three little kids at the time, a nine month old, a almost two year old and a three and a half year old. And, um, you know, of course, in a pandemic, when suddenly you have to work from home, you know, with three toddlers who can't virtual school themselves or virtual babysit themselves. Um, so that the pandemic and the pivot that everyone had to make through that for me was a further reconfirmation of a decision that I had made, you know, about a year and a half earlier, which was sometimes. Um, I think if you're a sing if anyone out there is a single parent or maybe, maybe just a parent at all, like you think that you have to be everything for your children too. So I had in my mind that I had to be mom, dad, like, and then this extra role of making up for things that my kids had experienced or would miss in their lives because of, you know, my decisions or my ex's decisions or whatever else. And like, so I had to be even, even more than just mom, even more than just mom and the missing dad, I had to like, have this extra third role also and a lot of guilt guiding those decisions. And like anything else, when you're operating from a place of shame or guilt or apologizing, you're never operating with the, the most clear judgment, the most present mind or heart. So I was fortunately, you know, even though my youngest was just nine months in, in, in making that move, you know, through the process of my um, very necessary divorce over the year and a half prior to that, I was able to kind of arrive at clarity and arrive at this place of like, I can be everything that my kids need me to be without being mom that is everyone, does everything, goes to everything. Like there is nothing I love to this day more than being at my kids' karate practices, my my daughter's dance rehearsals. Like I hate when my, oh, I have a nanny or my, my husband now takes, I hate it. I love going. I love being there, even if there's really crappy Wi-Fi service and it can't work. <laughs> like, I just love being there. But being the best mom that I can be doesn't actually mean that I have to do that every time. And so for me, there's a little bit of finding balance and that self-actualization and self-realization that that's not what makes me a good mom, right? Um, being my my office has. Um, <laughs> is very progressive in many ways. And also uh, we're in Florida, you know, quite conservative in other ways. So my, my work, I have a very unnecessary to be in my office position, but we've been in the office since October of 2020. So a full, you know, two years now we've been back in office and, you know, we have a three days in the week policy. And I just decided that was not necessary. <laughs> like, I, and I, I had to have those conversations and say, I can be a better employee to you if you give me a little bit more flexibility, right? So not everybody has that chance. Not everybody has that courage, but I, I did feel like I was put into a place where I had the confidence and a little bit of the awareness of my company situation where I could have that conversation, but I wouldn't have had that same level of comfort, you know, maybe at a different point in my career. Overall, the point being is first, we talked about like in the earlier, you know, uh, questions about what defining that success looked like. So for me, it was really just challenging my ideas of what that meant to me and that I didn't have to do all of these things to be a good parent or all of these things to be a great employee. I didn't have to show my face to be effective in delivering, you know, the best results for my clients. And and I had to accept that because once I accepted that, I could deliver on it better. And when I was like apologetic for it, and that's kind of what I hinted at earlier, when I was almost like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be there. Sorry. Like <laughs> when I was constantly doing that, I felt like it held me back. When I embraced it and gave myself permission, I felt like I could unleash it. And so that was really a big game changer for me. Thanks so much for sharing that, Krista. And, and I think you hit on several important themes, especially uh, that women, we say sorry a lot when we really don't need to. 
so uh, thank you for that. Uh, Jamie, what about you? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to pick up on a couple of things that both Tasha and Krista and, and Bhavna has said in the uh, chat. Please make sure everybody go read the chat for Bhavna's contributions as well. Um, as cliche as it sounds for me, the like epiphany moment was when my daughter was born. Um, I did not know what gender baby I was having at all. And, and it was like this moment for me that really solidified that I have a daughter and if I want the world to be different for her, that I need to start advocating and living it to Chris's point, actualizing on it now um i up until that point had been in this this mind frame that like if i just put my head down and work hard and work all the time and be available all the time someone will recognize my good work someone else and i measured my value to someone else's idea of what is valuable basically working all the time and being available all the time um and um and so for me it was recognizing that I need to own my own value as a person and know what that value is and stand strong in it. I'm a damn good tax lawyer. And I say that to myself, I'm not a person who curses. So when I, and I, I mentioned this in the book, when I say I am a damn good tax lawyer, it's because that word damn is like very empowering and significant to me in that moment. Um, and I'm owning the fact that I am good at it um, and very good at it. And, and also that my value comes from Ha just like the passion I have for my work, for my clients, for serving other people, for empowering others. But I also needed to advocate for it. Like I was not going to do anything with success if I was just sitting around waiting for someone else to recognize my value. I have to recognize my value and I have to act on it and own on it and advocate for it. Um, and so I started doing that. I started speaking up on my own behalf a lot more and, and kind of to that point of community, being in a community of other empowered women helped me do that um, because I could learn from their experiences of what worked and what didn't work, just like practical tips. How do I have this type of conversation? Well, here's what worked, here's what didn't work. But also women who have been, I have been in your position before and I support you in your effort to go do this. And that was very empowering. Um, but also things, um, you know, for to speak about, you know, wanting a world that is different for my daughter, wanting a legal community where women are at parity with men, not just in law school, but for every stage in every type of employment after law school as well, in every level from, you know, new entry all the way up to most senior management, um, for being in a community and advocating that parents are treated on parity with non-parents in the workforce. And that's things like parental leave and deliberately using the word parental, not maternity leave, um, to make sure that all parents have the chance to bond with and take care of their families and that we recognize growing and having families is important to legacy down the road. Um, at, you know, I you mentioned that I'm on the pump up the bar campaign with Mother's Esquire, and that is making sure that test takers who are sitting for the bar exam or CLEs or their law school exams have um, adequate accommodations for um, private and safe and sanitary places to pump and places to store expressed milk and the, you know, the knowledge that um, they need to be able to do that. And there's like physical pain that can come from not being given those accommodations. Um, stuff like that where, you know, I I felt like I needed to um, really stand much taller in the confidence that I had developed in my career. And, and kind of to, I think both Tasha and Krista's point about balancing and what Bhavna hinted at in her comment that um, I am a much, much better lawyer when there are other parts of my life that I bring into my practice of law. I don't make apologies anymore in speaking with my clients about my family. And I don't make apologies to my family when I have to work. Um, and I think it was both of those that I, you know, if, if there's points, you know, when we started to go back to the office and my daughter is just about five, so this has been half of her life this far in, in this pandemic, when we started to have to go back, she was really upset. She's like, no, mama, I don't want you to go. I like having you home. And it was at that point, I says, well, it's not that I have to go. It's that I am going back to work because I love my job. I love what I do. And I like that you get to see me 
have that love and have that passion because it's important for me that she had that kind of living example of the qualities that I want for her of confidence, of passion, of purpose, of being in community um, and of pursuing an ambition. I feel very fortunate to have had a stay-at-home mom, but I also am not that person. That is not me. Um, and I'm glad that my daughter has an example of a woman pursuing career ambitions. And that, that is a really major driving force for me. Yes, thank you so much, Jamie. I, it really is important to be the role models we want to be for our, our children and our community, and um, that uh, not making apologies goes uh, for everyone, right? Uh, not just for the work, but for the family as well. And uh, as Jamie alluded, uh, Bhavna has, uh, right, Bhavna is the quintessential writer. She's been putting uh, some wonderful morsels of wisdom in the chat, so please read that. Uh, Bhavna, we're going to try one more time and see if we could connect to you uh, so that you can share your thoughts live. But otherwise, uh, I do highly recommend that people read her thoughts because um, not only does she care about focusing on family for herself, but she's helping others uh, make that actualization as well. So Bhavna? Yes, I'm not sure if the network is going to support me for long, but as long as it does, um, for me, like I mentioned in the chat, it was the interview after relocating to Canada that changed the whole meaning of success for me and you know, brought me to realize that there was a life outside of work. And that's when I, I started taking it slow. I, I started to work on things outside and I figured out the passion to write. And and now I am helping business owners globally to enhance their digital presence with the hands and so on and so forth. And in quality time with my family on video call, um, you know, traveling, meeting them and yeah, keeping that bond alive. Exactly, exactly. So um, I, I think taking advantage of technology and I think the pandemic forced us all to take advantage of the, uh, the technology that's available. But uh, for those I think who have embraced it, they've been able to um, really try to maximize time with family, um, time at work. And so, um, and I love Bhavna that not only are you uh, doing that for yourself, but that you are helping so many other uh, business owners and, and writers and lawyers to uh, to achieve that as well. So thank you for that. Um, next, I'd like to turn to volunteerism because what I found inspirational was that in addition to all of your amazing careers, your family connectedness, everyone on this panel is a stalwart volunteer and leader with very important organizations. And so would you share with all of us you know, why you volunteer, what's your motivation, what keeps you engaged with which organizations and what capacities? And um, do you feel that volunteerism is part of your career, part of the work-life balance or both? Uh, I know Jamie alluded to it a little bit with Mother's Esquire. Uh, Jamie, do you wanna expand on that? Um, sure. I uh, am involved with a couple of organizations, um, Mother's Esquire, as you know about, um, and, which is a community of uh, lawyers who are parents, um, moms, um, who are there to advocate for one another and for gender parity in the law. Um, and that was a personal passion project for mine. Um, but also being involved in that type of community um, is both personal passion pro and also pre uh, profession driven and career driven um, because it's it's a community of helping one another um, navigate being a lawyer, but also a, a referral source. Um, what I have found is that women like to send business to other women in particular, if it's possible. And there's also a very well-documented issue in the legal profession about um, bias toward origination credit or against origination credit for women and business development for women. And so being part of Mother's Esquire um, and other similar communities is a way for me to work on my own business development skills and also to drive business to other women to help them have the same opportunity. Um, but in addition to what Mother's Esquire, um, 
I'm involved with my alumni um, association, as you mentioned, Trinity College. Um, I was the very fortunate recipient of very generous financial aid, and it's my way of giving back to that community. Um, and um, being really thankful for the opportunity um, to attend a school that really opened a lot of doors for me. Um, in my personal life, my husband's an alum too, and <laughs> in my profession, and I'm involved in a small nonprofit here in Maine um, called Community Dental, which is a nonprofit dental association here that provides really top-notch quality care to Mainers, regardless of their means, um, to access dental care. Um, and, um, you know, the smile, it tells a lot about a person um, and the confidence that they have to be able to project themselves and their health. And I really love the mission of the organization to embrace all Mainers, um, regardless of where they originated from. We have a very large and growing um, refugee community in Maine, um, and we serve them. Um, and also Mainers of all means um, from up in the county, as we call anything like in the northern half of the state. <laughs> <laughs> to people in the greater Portland area and Southern Maine. Um, and that is a way for me to get to know and build and invest in my local community, not just my national one. Excellent. I love that. I love the local and the national focus. And I also just wanted to share um, for those in the audience that Mother's Esquire was founded by Michelle Brown and Coughlin, who's a fellow commissioner on the Commission on Women in the Profession. And she's amazing, as is the entire board uh, on which Jamie also serves. So, uh, but thank you for sharing about, you know, several different volunteer organizations with which you uh, participate. Uh, what about others? I know everyone is very active. Tasha, how about you? Okay. Um, well, first and foremost, I think finding a way to give back is like an absolute must because the way I look at it anyway, we are so blessed to be in the positions that we have and to be in the careers that we have. And it's so important to, to reach back or to reach down and to pull others up and pull others along. And one thing that, that one thing for sure, sharing our stories um, is one way to do it. But I also look for ways to reach young people specifically because uh, those who are considering a career in law, those who should be considering a career in law um, are the ones that I'd like to talk to a lot and see where their heads are. Because again, if, if it hadn't been for my family member who suggested law school, I would have been on a totally, totally different path. Um, not to say that I would have been happy, but I would have made myself satisfied with it. And, and that's not necessarily how we should look at life. So you should all, always know what your options are. And if it takes just one person, if I say one thing to one person, the same way my family member said something to me that changes that person's life, then that's what I, that I'm, I'm always looking forward to do. So I spend a lot of my time volunteering, acting as a judge and juror on mock trial and moot court competitions. And I get a, a serious kick out of that because we're talking high school as well as college students. And these people are phenomenal. I have seen high school students that are so well-versed. They do so much better than, than actual attorneys. And I feel that first of all, they need to know that. They need to know, they need to feel confident in their abilities. They need to hear that they have what it takes so that they can actually, you know, dream about, oh, wow, well, I'm in high school, but maybe I will go to law school. Um, and even if they've made mistakes, a lot of times we feel that if we weren't perfect, then we're not good enough. We shouldn't go in that direction. We're all attorneys. We make mistakes all the time. So I think it's important that they understand that too. That's part of life. That's how you learn. A mistake is not going to ruin your career. So don't let that get in your way. But we, as lawyers, we're not perfect. And I am inspired by these young, intelligent students. And I've, I've been serving as a judge since 2018, um, several times a year. So that's really where I like to spend my time. The other way that I would like to, and maybe once I um, retire from what I do or something, is I'd love to get into um, a university where I'm working directly with 
students on their communication skills, because I think communication skills today will get you far. If you don't have what it takes in that, you really need to work hard for, on, on those communication skills. And those will take you really far in life, regardless of which direction you decide to go in. So I'd really like to get some hands-on experience working with students directly on their writing ability, their speech, all of that. So maybe I'll do that after I finish with what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that you, you brought it to uh, the high school and, and college uh, volunteerism. Um, when I was at Verizon, we used to work with uh, street law and we would go into high school classes to teach them about IP law or labor and employment or constitutional law. And it's always so amazing um, how much they, they want to learn and how much they, they know. And so uh, that's wonderful. Krista, how about you? Yeah, um, I, I share a lot of the same um, interests and reasons as Tasha for, for my involvement. Um, also a lot of similar activities. I, um, I coached my alma mater high school for uh, about five years, their mock trial team and um, my law school's uh, moot court team and, and some other things like that. Um, I wanna challenge one thing though, which was the idea of like, obviously our profession has pro bono requirements or strong suggestions, but I, I really find like, it, for me to really be the best lawyer, mom, whatever it is that I'm, I'm being at any given time, like I, I'm trying really actively to eliminate the musts. Like I, I'm choosing to do something because it, it adds, it adds value to my life because I think it brings value to other people's lives, but versus like from a place of having to do it, which I feel like was a big part of the first decade of my practice, like having to do things because it's what people did to get success, whatever that meant. Like, and so, you know, my pro bono practice, um, I've had, you know, one very long standing since I was admitted um, or shortly after I was admitted. Um, it's actually through the ABA. I'm part of the Veterans Claims Assistance Network, which helps um, veterans uh, appeal benefits claims and, and kind of takes them through that process. Um, and that's that's kind of fun and an interesting whole, <laughs> whole area of law um, and, you know, that that I had no experience with, but enjoy quite a bit and um, has has led to just, you know, interesting relationships and conversations. But for me, it, it is there's some selfish motivation in volunteerism, which is, like I said, um, pulling pulling something from me like it, it brings up something new in me and, and gives me joy and, and delight and um, like Tasha said, like I, I, I teach at um, the University of Miami Law School now as well. And between that high school level, the college undergrad level and, and law school level of which, you know, I'm involved in some way, shape or form in mock trial or moot court. Like it's, it is truly amazing. <laughs> like, I'm like, I could never be that good. <laughs> um, so I'm constantly inspired by it. it. It gives as much to me as it as it takes from time and everything else. And it's part of that overall balance that we're all trying to achieve. And I think we use the word balance, you know, almost too much, but balance is another word like success. Like you have to define what balance means to you. Balance might mean, you know, spending half your time at home, half your time in the office. It might mean, you know, spending some time volunteering and, and maybe it means not volunteering in the law for a little bit and volunteering with your kids' activities because that's the time you get with them. So I really believe that like, that's one of those things you constantly have to reevaluate as well. And if it's not bringing some, something to your life as well, it's not providing you joy, I mean, our, our time is money truly in this profession as much as any other. And it's important that we're able, the cost benefit analysis has to swing in the right favor. Well said, Krista, well said. And so uh, for Bhavna, she shared in the chat about her first volunteer experience was with the Women's Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries, sorry, I just lost it. Um, an industry council, and um, that one of the reasons why she uh, volunteers is because she feels like she's been showered with so many blessings, and uh, she just wants to be able to uh, share that with others, and that she finds it very grounding. Uh, Bhavna, let's try to see if uh, we can hear from you live to uh, to share your thoughts on um, your volunteer opportunities. Yes. Is it better? Audible? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so my idea of uh, volunteering came in only during pandemic because prior to that, like I mentioned, I was 
total workaholic and I didn't do anything outside of work. So when pandemic hit, I had to go back to India to stay with my family. And that's when I thought, let's just make the most of the time that we have. And I came across this opportunity within the writers group that I was writing for, uh, like you mentioned, for the reporter. Uh, that's where I figured out about this opportunity and I signed up. I got selected as well. And I started my journey as a council member. It, it was so empowering because there were so many new things that I learned during this year as a, as a council member. And it, it kind of helped me grow as an individual because I saw people were actually struggling to figure out what I already knew. And that was, that was a space where it hit like, oh my God, you have so many privileges. It's, it's time you start giving back more than you take now from the society. And so then I continued for the next year with the National Reproductive Health and Rights Council. Here we are uh, promoting more about the reproductive rights and health that is available to women in India, because there is a lot of ignorance on that aspect. India has been like a very conservative country about reproductive health and rights. And it's, it's time we openly spoke about what's happening to our bodies. So that's what uh, triggered me to get involved with this council. And along with this, I also help with uh, uh, coaching and mentoring young law students who are uh, planning to move from India to Canada just with the whole process and you know, helping them figure out how they can do it. Because when I moved, I did not have that support. And I was so shy to even ask for it. But me being out there and encouraging people to reach out to me for this support is something that I think I'm, I'm doing my best now. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Because a lot of times we don't know what we don't know. So we don't even know that we need to ask for help. And we don't know what questions to ask. So it's wonderful that you're helping uh, those who are uh, coming behind you uh, with uh, such logistical administrative uh, nightmares that, that that could be. So. Uh, thanks for that. So um, the next topic is for all of our panelists to share one to two practical tips that our audience can start doing today to determine the true meaning of their success and how to achieve it. Who would like to go first? I will, because then nobody will take mine. <laughs> Good strategy. <laughs> Uh, um, no, it's really more of a power strategy. I'm not sure when my power is going to go out. Um, I, I really embrace the, the mentality, um, which is so antithetical to our profession of slowing down. Like we're in this mindset constantly of just hurry, 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 try to get as much as you've done, bill as much as you can, send out as much as you can, go to as many things as you can, and really... I have found over the last few years of my life that kind of meditating instead of constantly stirring is sometimes better. And, and I really think that, like, I always talk about, you know, I think my phrase usually practicing at the top of my license, like I'm much more effective at doing my job, whether that's at work, at home, at teaching with my kids, when I am actually not trying to rush and I I'm, fully in, in immersed in whatever it is that I'm doing. And that comes from small practical tips, like disabling pop-up notifications on my Outlook email to, you know, like small, simple, soft skill kind of things like that to really investing in myself and finding um, the why in, in the things that I do. So that's probably my, my best overall strategy in, in finding success and defining it and, and, and achieving it really is just don't feel like you're getting through and to get it done, like actually figure out the, the reasons and the motivations behind it and, and make sure that that works for you currently. Cause what might've worked in getting you into law school and graduating law school and taking the bar and in the early years of your career might not work for where you are now. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you again for doing this in the midst of hurricane Ian <laughs> and, uh, Thanks. I'm, I'm very glad the power stayed on so that we can yeah, hear all too. of your insights. <laughs> so who else would like to go? One to two practical tips. I want to jump on to something Actually, that Krista said. Just oh, go ahead, Bhavna. While your while your connection works, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Go, go, go. 
Okay, okay, I'll, I'll take this opportunity. Yes, um, two tips from my end would be um, take risks because you never know what next will bring you to what you want. So try exploring as much as you can. You're never old enough to try new things. So go out and do it. And the second one would be to ask for help. Uh, like I mentioned in my last response, I was too shy when I started out. And that kind of, you know, set back a little for me. But now I'm all out there. I am asking people for help. I am supporting people who I can. And that, that is kind of changing the trajectory for me in terms of my career growth as well. So these are the two tips from my end. And thank you, Jamie, for letting me take this chance while my network still supported. <laughs> no, no, no. So much, Pavna. Jamie, um, how about you? Uh, picking up on um, a very practical tip that, um, and following on what Krista said, one thing that I realized similarly was the need to build to, to build out and carve out time to think and time to practice um, and actually like do the work that I am being asked to do by my clients. So um, one thing that I did that was very, very helpful for me just as a practical matter was carve off time blocks on my calendar and on my day where I am not available for conference calls or meetings or, or other things. So I had to intentionally make space to sit and do the work. Um, and on that point, I I schedule the times of the day that I go check my email um, for work because I, like Krista, found the pop-up and the ding notification um, very distracting and like this gut, almost like Pavlov's dog, right? You know, this is gut instinct. Like I see the pop-up, I have to go check that email and it would interrupt my flow of actually doing work because let's be real, we're lawyers, we actually have to do work, whatever that work is, we have to do it. Um, and so as a practical matter, carving out that space really made a huge difference in my ability to do my job well and in an efficient and timely manner for my clients. Um, and then just as a practical, like meta tip, if you will, um, I strongly encourage people like look into coaches, look into professional coaches, because I found that I needed someone outside of myself and outside of my team to learn the day-to-day -day skills that I wanted to learn in being a lawyer. Um, I know you said two tips, but I'm going to do a third one because I think that's important. We've talked a lot about community. Um, I think it's really important to find whatever that community is for you um, to to know that you have a support network around yourself, whether that a community is your immediate family, as it is for so many of us, or a community of other people, whether it's, you know, your religious community or your cult, you know, your local community. But it's really important um, to have a community support with you and know that you have that. And so I really encourage people to, to, to do what you can to find it digitally or in person. I am a fan of digital community building. So uh, put that out there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. And, and the two is just a minimum. So feel free to share as many as you'd like. Tasha, how about you? Um, well, I think my first one would be to, and I, we've touched on this during this, this webinar too, is to not allow your job to become who you are because you have to be, you have to figure out who you are outside of your career, outside of everything. Like who are you personally? And, and what are your, your likes and dislikes and, and what drives you on a daily basis? And it can't be, it can't be that, it can't be the career, it can't be the job. Always try to separate yourself from that because when the job goes away, then who, what are you left with? Who are you at that point in time? So always try to figure out who, who you are and, and define that for yourself while you're, while you're employed. And then if anything ever does happen, that that takes that away from you, then it shouldn't be taking you away from you. So always keep that in mind. Um, second is always decide what your priorities are and don't be ashamed about the decisions that you make. You have to make conscious decisions though. Make sure that once you make a decision, you're gonna stick to that decision and you understand what the consequences are once you make that decision. So let's say if you're, if you're going for law, and money is important to you, then go for it. Don't apologize for it because that's what you want at that point in time. But make sure that your decision is knowing, knowingly and thoughtfully decided without regret. 
that's one thing you don't want to have after everything is said and done. You don't want to be regretting anything. Um, a third thing would be um, if you decide to have a family, you have to be able to figure out what your boundaries are. So when you're with your family, and Krista was just talking about this, every, I think everybody really focuses on this, but Krista mentioned this too. When you're with your family, be with your family. Um, Jamie said the same thing. When you're with your family, be with your family. When you're at work, be at work. That means you've got to figure out how to, how to set boundaries for yourself. If it means you're turning off your, your notices or you're, you're putting your, your phone away so that you're not paying attention to email. When you're with your family, try to be with them. Don't try to multitask because it doesn't cut it. Um, when you're at work, you've got to make sure that your family understands you're at work. You're not mommy right now. Even, in, even when you're working from home, it's very difficult, but you've got to draw a line somewhere because when mommy's working, mommy's working. When mommy's with family, mommy's with family. So that's always um, very key moving forward is to how do you make those boundaries for yourself? How you make it work and how do you stick to it? It's, it's very difficult to do because at some point you're going to let something creep in, but try not to allow that to happen. Oh, that's such great advice. That's such great advice. Be present. Whatever you're doing, be present. So that's great. Um, let's go to uh, Q and A, and um, I've been trying to follow the chat. I love how engaged everyone has been, but no one has actually been using the Q and A function. But one of the questions that showed up in the chat was, um, were there any books or tools that were helpful to you during your journey? And in the chat, they were specifically asking about business development. Uh, one plug that I would like to make for any books or tools is that the Commission on Women in the Profession puts out a newsletter called Perspectives. And there's some really amazing articles in there. And so I would highly recommend that everybody sign up for that. And so, um, but let me also open up to uh, the panel to see if there were any books or tools that you found helpful, maybe also specifically about networking or business development. And were there any that you wish you had during law school or during the early part of your career? So uh, Tasha, why don't we go with you? I see you nodding your head. Okay. Um, well, first and foremost, one book that I really wish I had was this book, Women <laughs> in Law. I think we all can agree to that. Um, that would have been really helpful in law school and even after law school. But I do find there are a couple of other books that, that I found to be helpful in terms of um, pursuit of a law career specifically. And coincidentally, Heidi K. Brown wrote the foreword for our book, but she has three of her own books. And I think they are all well worth the reading. Um, there's The Introverted Lawyer, The Flourishing Lawyer, and Untangling Fear in Lawyering. And I think a lot of times women specifically have to deal with certain issues going into a career like this. And those books really helped in terms of really figuring out how to handle the stress of this type of profession. So look those up um, if you're interested in, in finding out more about how to handle the day-to-day -day and dealing with those issues when, you're, when your personality doesn't necessarily fit your career. How do you handle that? Awesome, thank you so much for that, Tasha. Jamie, how about you? Yeah. I wanna put in another plug. I think it's perspective. I think it's perspectives that I'm thinking about, but um, Every time the newsletter comes out, there's a feature of a woman rainmaker. It's either Perspectives or the Women in Litigation newsletter that comes out, but it's a monthly feature of a woman who like is very good at business development and rainmaking and about like practical tips that she has implemented, what has worked for her, what um, about business development does she enjoy or not enjoy or, or things that she would reflect on. And I find those very helpful just in learning um, tips. Um, there's also a podcast, Build Your Book, which is for lawyers about business development that is like specific to, you know, business development and private sector um, or private practice that I recommend just on the business development side of, of practical tips <laughs> and being a successful lawyer. Um, and I, it, Krista's, um, Krista's 
own posts on LinkedIn, I really, really love. Um, I'm external counsel to a lot of businesses. And so I find it really helpful to learn from other in-house counsel, like Cresta, Lisa Lang is another one um, that um, I, I just, what, what do they look for? How do they approach their jobs? What do they look for in external counsel? What is of value to them or not? Um, and that helps me learn how to be of better service to them. So. Just kind of jumping on what Jamie said, and thank you for that. That was extremely kind of you. <laughs> um, you know, if, if I'm sure we're all lawyers, so books are all of our things, but like LinkedIn is such a good place. Like, let's not skip the value of that platform. That's how most of us that are um, co-authors of this book met um, and how most of us started and launched our businesses. And um I mean, if you're not using LinkedIn as a contributor, use it as a consumer and uh, and read and connect. And uh, it doesn't have to be those like awkward as somebody asks, like, you know, reach outs on LinkedIn, just kind of follow along and can, and add to the conversation, add value, you know, when you're looking to, to take as well. Eventually you kind of become a person who is an SME in, in your various, you know, area, and it kind of just comes to you. So it, some of it is, is a little bit more organic and natural than, than you might think by utilizing that platform. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, I think we have a couple of more minutes and, uh, someone had added in the Q and a, any advice for a longtime lawyer who never quite found her fit and finds the work boring and tedious. Don't be afraid of that. Don't say it like it's a bad thing. Own it. I think leaning into exactly how you feel and be like, this isn't working for me. Don't, don't apologize for finding it boring. Sometimes it is. And it might be more boring for you. Like if I was doing tax law, Jamie, I would be super bored. <laughs> um, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, keep, keep going. Keep pushing. It doesn't, I don't mean keep going in your current job, career, whatever. Don't be afraid, like that's okay. The law didn't work for me. I didn't like this particular area of law. Go and look, embrace it. Don't go to an interview and be like, oh yeah, I'm like kind of found this boring and worried they're gonna think that means you don't have attention to detail. No, just say it like this wasn't working. This wasn't doing it. And I work best when I'm, you know, my passion is running through my veins and I'm able to, to really give to my clients or, or when you change career paths entirely and, and look for an entirely different profession, take the same thing. Not only can I be a CPA, but I was a badass lawyer. I just, it, was, it wasn't enough for me. <laughs> like, take it on. Excellent. Thank you so much, Krista. And so um, I really just want to take the time to thank everyone, all of our panelists for joining us today, despite hurricanes and technical IT issues. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights, your stories. Uh, for being honest and authentic with all of our participants. And I'd like to thank all of our uh, participants as well for being so engaged in the chat. Please do reach out to uh, all of these panelists. And um, as Krista said, LinkedIn is such a wonderful platform for reaching out to people. And uh, thank you so much for attending this first installment of the Commission's Navigating Your Career. So be on the lookout for the next ones. And uh, I hope you'll join um, and research the different projects that the commission offers, especially the GRIT project. The toolkits are amazing. Uh, the scenarios have been updated to include, you know, pandemic. Uh, we're uh, updating them to include team scenarios. So I think everyone will find them very useful. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks all, and thanks Jen for organizing a great, great panel. It was oh really no, wonderful. thank you. <laughs>